Welcome. Everything is fine. You're listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week, we're talking about Season 1, Episode 9, Someone Like Me as a Member. This episode was written by Jen Statsky. She's a staff writer on another show that we love, Broad City. Woo woo! Yay! <laughs> yes! <laughs> This episode is directed by Dean Holland. He was a producer on Parks and Rec and also on Netflix's show Love, which is a show that I watched the entire first season and I still couldn't tell if I liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people have that opinion on girls. Mm, yeah, that's how I felt after watching the first season and then I kind of just stopped watching it, mm. which is what happened with Netflix's Love too, so... This episode aired November 3rd, 2016, and this is the last episode that aired in 2016. Holy, they took a long time off. That's like two months. Yeah. Uh, They didn't come back till January so that NBC could air football on Thursday nights. Boo. Boo, sports, boo. (laughs) But season two will move to Tuesday night at 930, so hopefully we won't have a long break during that season. So what are your initial thoughts on this episode? I like it. I don't think it's super important. Oh, okay. I feel like it's really building up to the next part, like the next episode. All right. We get a lot more Trevor, which is great. And Mm -hmm. we see a bit more of his entourage of jerks. Yeah. We get a tease of the bad Janet. That's true. But I don't feel like a lot happens. It just, it's building up to the finale, the final, the final stretch. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. So it almost feels like a bit of a filler. Hmm. I feel like we get some really valuable stuff in this episode, but plot-wise, we're not moving forward as quickly as we normally do. Yeah, Yeah. we we do get a bit more of the real Eleanor as well, which is nice. Mm Mm-hmm. But the meat and potatoes of the series begins the next couple episodes. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Because really, we're just spending time with our characters. We're not really doing yeah, exactly. a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. All Which, right. don't get me wrong, I like that. It's great. But as far as progressing the plot, it doesn't do a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, that's, that's valid. I think I might be a little bit... I think I might like this episode a little bit more than you do. But I guess we'll find out as we talk about it. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's get right into it. Michael explains the mix-up to real Eleanor and fake Eleanor. They were both killed the same traffic accident. Michael starts negotiations to keep Eleanor in the good place and urges her to stay on her toes. In the first flashback, we see young Eleanor reject all social groups at her high school, preferring to keep to herself. It really seems to me like they should have a photo of you in your file. Because this would have prevented this entire (laughs) mix-up. And we wouldn't have a show. Yeah, we wouldn't have a show, but maybe at this point they'll go... Oh, we 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 should have photos of them. Yeah. It would make sense. Especially for all the John Smiths in the world. Yeah. Hello. Like, some of them are going to be born on the same day in the same city. Exactly. And one guy could look completely different from the other. Have their pictures. Come on. I guess it's such a rare occasion that somebody will die in the exact hundredth or like ten hundredth of a second Mm. that they never really needed it. But come on. Come on, guys. And then I started thinking about, well, Eleanor's situation is a special case, but what about Jason? He doesn't share the same name as the person he's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It's possible that they died in the same second. Yeah. But it doesn't also seem like they came from the same location. Exactly. Because Jason died, as far as we know, in Florida. Right. Right? I don't think this Gianyu guy died in Florida. At least I doubt it. It wouldn't really make sense. No. So it could be a whole other situation. Yeah. So what the heck is going on here? Your system is like messing up it's all over the apart, place. Michael. Yep. It's crumbling. <laughs> the foundation is crumbling to the core. We need to fix the whole infant... In, in, I was going to say infant structure. That's it's a, been a long that's day. That's a Rickyism. Um, <laughs> infrastructure. <laughs> Well, he's already failed at fixing the hole in the good plates. That's true. 
It just started doing its own thing. <laughs> yeah. And fixing it has up. no control over the good place anymore. Ah! <laughs> In this scene, we see some of the members of Trevor's posse uh, busy taking selfies. And I started to wonder, does social media exist or are they in the just afterlife? being annoying? Because that's what annoying people do. Yeah, but how interesting would it be, like social media in the afterlife? If you have like hell version of Facebook, but maybe only the bad place has it. Because social media is bad. Well, it has been t- known to be toxic on occasion. Yep. So maybe they have like. A bad place version of Instagram, you know? Where nobody follows you. No one follows you. You wish nobody... Everybody posts really bad pictures of gross food (laughs) instead of, like, good food. Hey, just getting tortured today. Snap it. But, like, I don't know. Yeah, anyway. It's just a little random thought I had, but it'd be kind of funny to see, like... Someone do a mock-up of the Bad Places version of Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Or like Reddit or something. And if they would end up being exactly as they are now. Oh, it would be no different. Yeah, <laughs> no yeah, different. Yeah, no different. <laughs> I'm sure someone's listening going, uh, Vivian, you know Facebook is the social network of the Bad Place, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's where it came from. We got the idea from the bad place. That's where you argue with your relatives about <gasps> politics. Does that mean we are in the bad place? <laughs> Oh, God. I don't know. That's scary. Let's not go down that hole. (laughs) That's why there's so many social networks and so many social media applications. That's why people keep sending me emails to join LinkedIn. Oh, my God. The worst. Okay. (laughs) And send me penis enlarging emails. (laughs) So Trevor keeps mentioning to Eleanor that she should smile more. Mm Mm-hmm. And in the pilot, that's one of the bad deeds from the orientation video. Telling people to smile? Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, no, telling a woman to smile. Oh, okay. I don't think... I don't know whether that's something that guys deal with, because I've never had somebody say that to me. No one's ever told me to smile. I don't know. Maybe that's just another female problem. (laughs) That makes it sound so, like, female (laughs) problem. But, yeah, a problem that that women generally have to deal with. Deal with more often. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, dude, you should flex more. (laughs) Would that be the equivalent? Maybe you don't feel like flexing today. Yeah, gosh. (laughs) Maybe my pecs are a little swole from last night and they're sore. So... I will not make them dance for you, ma'am. But yeah, just some guy being like, hey, baby, you should smile more. You're so pretty, you know? And you're like, eh, no. Hmm. Mm -mm. So it's very fitting that Trevor asks Eleanor that because... It's pretty douchey thing to do. Yeah. Do you remember, actually, this is a callback to Broad City, um, in an episode where uh, Alana and Abby are walking down um, the street and a guy tells them they should smile and they push their mouths up with their middle fingers. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's the reaction to it. It's like, no, no, no. I don't want to smile just because you told me to smile. Like, I'm going to smile if there's something to smile about. I don't want And songs. you, sir, Give are... Give me n- something to sing about. Yeah, exactly. Kind of. Right. <laughs> yeah. Kind of exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to smile because of your comment, bro. Yeah. So moving on to the flashbacks, what did you think of the, our first flashback? It was interesting to see young Eleanor and... If I were more ballsy, I would have probably done the exact same thing in high school. What? No. Because I didn't really care to be part of all these groups. Yeah, but she's pushing away everyone. Yeah, I guess. You're a pretty friendly person. Like, you like people. You want to have friends. Yeah, I do. That's true. I'd still do it, though. (laughs) Just to be cool. (laughs) Well, I'm, I'm... I think in high school, I was very antisocial and I was okay with that. I had like five or six friends and that was it. Does that count as being very antisocial? I had for the whole four years. So I had acquaintances and like people that I would nod to and smile at, but I wouldn't go outside of my circle Hmm. and I didn't care to. I don't think we were a clique. I think we were like just a bunch of misfits. Oh my God. Maybe that is a clique. Were you the breakfast club? (laughs) 
we were we had people from all sorts of groups, which was a little weird. Hmm. Interesting. It just I don't get the point of the flashback, despite like I understand that the flashback is saying Eleanor didn't like being around people. She didn't like interacting with people. But I don't see that as bad. No, I don't think it's supposed to be like a bad deed. Cause I don't Unlike th- all the other flashbacks. Mm-hmm. I don't think that preferring to keep to yourself makes you a bad person. Right. I think she's a little rude, obviously, to the <laughs> people. A but big she's making a point. It, like yeah. she's making a point. I really don't have any interest in being friends with anybody here. I thought it was great. It was it was really well done. Especially after her big speech and the the guy comes up to her like, yeah, that was really great. Anti-establishment and way to break them. And like, no, 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 no. If this were any other show or movie, I would start joining your band of... Misfits. I guess your band of misfits and we would be all anti-school and anti-cliques and we'd have this whole thing going on. But no, this isn't what's happening. Mm -mm. (laughs) That's not Eleanor. She doesn't want to be part of your breakfast club. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think that it's really just showing us that Eleanor doesn't want to be part of any team. She just wants to be alone. Mm -hmm. But also that she's actively pushing people away and she's been doing it since she was in high school. Right. And she pushes people away by insulting them, generally. Being, like, rude and then isolating herself. So how does this fit in with her going with her office friends for drinks at the bars. That's something I was going to bring up later, actually, but we can talk about it now. Um, I think it's kind of inconsistent, but if I think that, or if I head canon, that the people from the bar or the co-workers from like that Google type place mm-hmm. that we see later in this episode, then it works a little bit better for me. And I don't really think she saw them as friends. I think she just went so she could get drunk and get a ride from somebody. Exactly. I think they were a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Because she never really seemed to care about them. Right. She didn't care about them at all. She wasn't at all heartbroken when they said, you're banned from Thursday night drinks. She's (laughs) like, okay. Whatever. Bye. (laughs) And she pretty much just abused the system while she was doing it. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think those were the people that were going out for drinks from that like fake drug company. No, I don't think so. But if they were, then it makes a little bit more sense to me because she would be hanging out with people that she thinks are equally as crappy as her. Mm -hmm. Because if you're working for that company, you're not a great person. You're not the best person. Right? right? Yeah. You're a shady individual, probably. (laughs) Well, at least you're not too concerned with the moral implications. Right. For sure. When I first watched this episode, I thought it was a little... Surprising that Eleanor wasn't part of the mean girl clique in high school because making fun of nerds and stealing someone's parents' liquor sounds like something that pre death Eleanor would totally do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she seems pretty jaded at a young age. Mm-hmm. I was wondering how they do the fake braces. And I think it's probably just like, like you were saying the other night when I asked you, that was probably like a retainer type thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And while I was Googling it, oh, no. I found out that fake braces were a trend in parts of Asia because mm. they demonstrated wealth. Because like, if you could afford to have braces, right. then your family had money. Of course. But the thing is, some of the braces, like they were actually installed on your teeth, like oh. proper braces, except wow. they weren't real. But they, a lot of the time they were made with really cheap metal and some people died. Wow. When was this? Yeah. In the early 2000s, I think. Jeez. Yeah. Weird trend. Yeah. I found out that the title of this episode actually comes from a Groucho Marx quote. Uh, I, I believe it. Yeah, I guess he said, I don't want to belong to any club that will accept me as a member. I think that that's something that we should keep in mind while we're going through this episode, especially in regards to Eleanor, because I think that really informs how I see it and how I view a lot of her actions and a lot of the flashbacks. Okay. All right, so we'll move on. Tahani offers to host the Bad Place crew in her home, hoping to placate them. Fake Eleanor and Chidi give real Eleanor a tour of her new home, and Trevor joins the trio for dinner. The Bad Place crew are predictably awful, teasing Michael and insulting Tahani's spread. More Trevor. 
Warren M. Scott. Yes. He's pretty fantastic yeah. at being the friggin' worst. <laughs> yep, Just he really is. Just the worst. And he calls oh Eleanor God. the third wheel, where he's pretty much the third wheel. Yeah, yeah, he is super not invited to this. Yeah. Chidi would be happy to have Eleanor along. Sorry, Chidi would be happy to have fake Eleanor along to dinner. Yeah, I think so. And real Eleanor seems to be very open to talking to fake Eleanor. Oh, like, yeah. she seems very sympathetic and sweet. because she's perfect. Okay, so let's just bring this up now, then. How do you <laughs> feel about real Eleanor? Do you she's like good, her? She's Miss Goody Goody like Tahani, but in a more, a more down-to-earth way. And not putting other people down sneakily. Okay, so she's not condescending. Right. Do you really think her and Tahani are on the same level? Of goodness? Yeah. Intention-wise, no. Okay. But they both seem pretty good. So Tahani, who raised money, like $60 billion for charity, Mm -hmm. and Eleanor, who went on like relief missions to Ukraine and helped people get off death row. Mm -hmm. Those are equal. How do you think that those trips and those actions got their money and got their funding? I still think that it's it's Hmm. equal but different. Like it's, it's comparing apples and oranges. Real Eleanor is the action, like hands dirty type person. And Mm -hmm. Tahani is the behind the scenes um financer yeah financier sure all right i think that i lean towards real eleanor being a better person Mm -hmm. because she's the person doing the work doing the hard stuff i think i think it's much harder emotionally physically to actually do the work and be there for the people having to spend all that time helping innocent people get off death row like that's a lot of time and effort and stress for you Mm -hmm. and going on missions to the ukraine and to and dealing (laughs) with all kinds of people in horrible situations like actually being there for them i think is more valuable that's that's how i see it Mm -hmm. not that the money that these organizations get isn't valuable obviously they need that money for Mm -hmm. supplies and all that kind of stuff but yeah i think being there is more important i think the world needs both people Both people so that the work happens. Yeah. Okay. I like real Eleanor. I think she's sweet. I think she seems really perfect. But I think that's the point of this episode too. Because we're seeing it a little bit through Eleanor's eyes, right? She's comparing herself to a person who seems to be perfect. Yeah. When you first meet someone like that, you don't tend to see their flaws first. You tend to see everything that they're amazing at. And everything that's amazing about them. Yeah. And you can't help but compare yourself, right? And multiply that exponentially with Eleanor because she took her place. Mm Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, exactly. They have the same name. They're being compared by literally everyone else. She's being called fake Eleanor. Like, she's already being put down with that name. Yeah. She feels like she's losing a bit of a connection to Chidi now. And she probably feels like she's being really selfish about it, too, because, of course, she wants to keep cheating her life and still stay friends with him. And I think maybe there's a spark of romance there. I think so, anyway. And every time that real Eleanor mentions being tortured and everything, that's like another stab at fake Eleanor. This is me getting tortured when it should have been you. Oh, interesting. I don't see it that way. Well, I don't think it's not... I don't mean that real Eleanor is saying that... I'm getting tortured because of you. Oh, okay. She's just mentioning it. Oh, yeah, you know, I get tortured. No problem. It's just these things that happen. And every time she says that, that's Eleanor having that realization hammered into her again and again that I took this perfect woman's place. Okay. And this is something that is going to happen to me. Yes. I'm going to have to take that place. And I almost feel like I deserve it. Oh, I think she absolutely thinks she deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. Despite wishing there was a medium place. Yeah. I think... No, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. Um, Speaking of the torture that she had to endure in the bad place, she says that every day she had to organize a baby shower for a woman she didn't know, and she had to remember everyone's name. (laughs) That sounds like a hellish experience. I know it's supposed to be kind of like a joke. But that sounds horrible. Mm-hmm. I 
hate small talk. With Hate people with you passion. don't know. Oh. oh my god, I don't care. <laughs> so, what, uh, do you know what baby you're having? Wait, that doesn't make sense. No. <laughs> do you know <laughs> what baby you're having? <laughs> do you, have you picked out a name yet? I'm sorry, what was your name? Oh, now I'm supposed to remember two names. Great. <laughs> no, I just, I don't like small talk. I don't love talking about babies. Yeah, it just sounds aggravating and for me anxiety inducing because you would have to remember all these names and you try to do a really good job otherwise you get shocked so that's just not fun mm-hmm. um i just quickly want to go back to michael and to honey's conversation when you see bad janet for the first time mm-hmm. um and Tani asks what is even the purpose of a janet who behaves in such a manner that's such a good point. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, it makes total sense. No, it doesn't. Of course it does. How? You're in the bad place. Mm-hmm. You have a question. Yeah. And you don't get an answer. Why would you even have, like, why would you have a question or anything? Janet, what's my torture schedule next week? Who's, you know, who is this person or anything? You could say, hey, can you get me, you know, some water because it's really hot down here. Here you go. And then it's boiling water. Oh, okay. <laughs> or like, sure I can. Not. And just be a complete jerk about everything. Yeah, I guess so. It just seems like it would be more efficient to not have a Janet at all. I disagree because it's more torturous to have something that doesn't work than to not have it at all. Hmm. Okay. If you have a bread maker, for example, and you're like, oh, great, I'm going to make some bread and it fails, then that option of making bread is just gone instead of not even bringing up like i'm gonna make bread why would you even say i'm gonna make bread if you don't have a bread maker Mm. you're just gonna be like oh i'll just go buy some bread instead of i'm gonna make some bread and then it turns out to be a yeasty ball of crap (laughs) every single time (laughs) so you get more and more frustrated at the stupid bread maker and maybe you hope that this time this time it's gonna work but it never Never does does. oh keeping, keeping the hope alive yeah is so much worse than never having hope at all Maybe. Possibly. It's bad, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, to me, it makes complete sense to have bad Janet. Because okay. Because she would just be useless, and you'd get so frustrated. I guess it just seems like a lot of work to create an all-knowing computer program that's not going to be at all helpful. I think the whole concept of the bad place is a lot of work. Some of the activities that are mentioned are fairly elaborate, like having a baby shower planning time, and needing to know names and then getting tortured if you don't remember it and then you've got sleeping on a bed of nails and i'm sure there's all sorts of other activities that are lined up yeah and that's all trevor yeah. does that's all they do is probably come up with ways to torture you i guess so in crazy and weird ways and really they could just be more efficient if they made everyone in the bad place feel like they were right about to drown all the time right or, or like you get skin burning alive. alive, sure, all the time, and no variation on that. Boring. Trevor would get bored. Yeah, I guess they probably do it for their own entertainment just as much as they do for torture. Absolutely. So. Okay, you've talked me around on bad Janet. I'm interested to see if any of the listeners agree with us now, or if they really do think that bad Janet is pointless. In the extended episode. Real Eleanor mentions that another orphan taught her to read and write, but it turned out to be a gibberish language that the orphan taught her as a prank. Mm -hmm. Which is just awful. (laughs) It's so sad. Yep. To have someone mess with you in that kind of way, that's harsh. Mm -hmm. That's harsh. But then we get the best joke. Oh, favorite joke in this episode when she's saying, yada, 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 learned English from watching Seinfeld. Perfect. And it was perfect for me because as soon as she said, and yada, 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 I was like, oh, it's, I wonder if that's a Seinfeld reference. And mm-hmm. then, like a split second later, she says that. So that's perfect. I thought it was great. Uh, the last thing I want to say before we move on was that seeing Chidi and real Eleanor get along so well made me a little bit sad. Made me feel a little bit like how I imagine Eleanor feels. 
Like, she has this really close relationship with him and it's being torn away from her. Despite it making complete sense. Yeah, exactly. And despite wanting him to be happy, you know? Like, of course, I as a viewer, I want to see Chidi be happy. I think that he deserves that. Mm -hmm. And he deserves to have his true soulmate. Right. Like, we talked about, I think, back in episode five, you know, Eleanor realized that her being there kept him from having that part of his afterlife. Yeah, as long as she is there, he will never have his true soulmate. Exactly. And now that he has her... It's bittersweet, you know, for her and also for me because I like Eleanor, fake Eleanor, and Chidi. Yeah. So as long as she's there, he will not be happy. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, he could be. But not to his fullest potential. Ow. Okay. All right, let's move on. Make me sad. One last thing before we move on. I think it's really sweet that Michael thinks that Trevor's posse will really like Tahani's layout her party layout like her food and all that mm-hmm. oh michael and the first thing they say is this sucks of course she <laughs> served them like cream cheese and cucumber sandwiches if you look at them it's like the crust cut off that stuff you serve at like afternoon tea mm-hmm. there's no way people from the bad place will like that stuff not even like a chance yeah i no. just thought that was that was hilarious all right Janet and Jason share a moment while the Bad Place crew throws a rager. At the Good Plates, fake Eleanor stays behind with Trevor while Chidi and real Eleanor tour the neighborhood. In a flashback, Eleanor insists on buying her own ticket when she's invited to see a movie with her roommate. So this moment between Jason and Janet is kind of sweet, but to be honest, is a little bit diminished now that I've thought about Janet's personhood. (laughs) Because when I was first, first watching the show, I was just casually watching it, right? Right. And so I thought this moment was really sweet between two people. And now it just seems sad, I guess. It is a little sad because Jason seems to have this respect and this moment and this trust in sharing his emotions with Janet. Mm-hmm. And yeah. she is a robot. Yeah. And she even acts robotic in her responses. Mm-hmm. Doesn't hug him back. Doesn't really understand why he would hug her at all. Why did you do that? Because you're the only one who's nice to me. And that's And that's sad. so sad. Yeah. Because that's part of her protocol. Mm -hmm. Like, that's part of her programming to make the residents happy. So, of course, she's going to be kind to him. And he thinks that she's kind because she doesn't treat him like an idiot, like pretty much everybody else there. Right. And she got him stuff for his butthole. She listens to his story about jalapeno poppers. But really, this moment just reinforces how isolated Jason feels ever Mm -hmm. since he's been in The Good Place. Because at first he had to just hide by not talking, right? And then once he found Eleanor, I think he probably thought, oh, great, like I have someone like me now. And he does, but Eleanor is actively trying to get better. Yeah, they're not on the same level. And even though Chidi knows about him, they're completely different people. And Chidi, I don't think, really respects him or is very kind to him. Like he's helping him with his, with the ethics lessons, but he's so wrapped up in Eleanor that he's not really paying that much attention to Jason. You wish he was wrapped up in Eleanor. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I wouldn't say no, but <laughs> um, <laughs> now you got me distracted. I'm thinking shipper thoughts. Okay. Um, no, he's, he's too distracted with everything that's going on with Eleanor to really pay much attention to Jason. Yeah. And he doesn't have any real friends here. It's sad. Mm -hmm. And you're right. She does respond like a robot because Jason says to her, well, it doesn't matter if you know things. All that matters is what's in your heart. And she's like, well, I mean, it does matter if I know things because I'm an information delivery system and I don't have a heart, but thanks. Completely shutting down what he said. Yeah. Even though he said it with a, like he meant it. He's, it's a heartfelt thing that he said to try and make her feel better. Mm Mm-hmm. Because he cares for her in some weird way, he does. Yeah. Right? When he said that, I assume that that's something that he heard from someone else when he was on Earth. Mm -hmm. Like maybe his mom, because he's not that smart. So someone probably told him at some point, like, you know, it's okay that you're not that smart as long as you have, you know, a heart. Good intentions and, like, you know, what matters is in your heart. And most of what he does that's really bad seems to be more out of stupidity than <laughs> yeah. than maliciousness. Absolutely. So, yeah. Barring that Molotov cocktail onto the sea dew. Yeah, that was just mean. Yeah. That was just But he was wronged. He was wronged. Yeah. 
<laughs> was he though? Mm, no. No. No, he wasn't. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of love, like, as much as I, it's sad to see Michael be such a pushover, it's kind of funny what he ends up doing, especially when he breaks out the karaoke machine and he has the little flashing um, necktie and the glasses and he starts playing Who Let the Dogs Out. <laughs> okay, I laughed really hard at that moment because Who Let the Dogs Out is like the perfect annoying song. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually looked this up and it was ranked third in Rolling Stone's 20 most annoying songs and ranked number one in Spinner's top 20 worst songs ever. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Do you know any of the other songs on that list? I looked up some of them. Yeah. Was Cher's Believe in Love or? Yep. Oh my God. Cher's Believe was part of that. Oh, yes. The other songs that I noted were My Humps by the Black Eyed Peas. (laughs) Okay. Which is god awful. Uh-huh. Alanis uh, Morissette's cover of that is really funny. Oh, I haven't she heard that one. She actually did a cover of it. It's great. Huh. And then there's Céline Dion's My Heart Will Go On. Really? Aw. Which is, I think it's only annoying because it was probably heavily overplayed oh, when absolutely. Titanic came out. And, and it's it's a very sappy song. Like, it's, sure. it's very sweet, but it's very sappy. And it's got a recorder in it. Oh my god, it does. Yeah. Okay. So, I recently watched Titanic. Yes, you did. Ago. The other night I walked into the living room and I was like, Jason, what are you watching? Uh, Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Leo's on the screen. Kate Winslet. Uh, just, uh, just popped on Titanic. Yeah, you know, casual movie. No big. Three hours, like 20 <laughs> minutes later. <laughs> it's a masterpiece. James Cameron is a genius. It- anyway, <laughs> the point is that theme is played throughout the movie mm. many times. Yes, but the is. song is never played until the credits. Right. So all those shots of Leo and Winslet on the bow of the Titanic, you know, I can fly or whatever, all that crap. And the song playing over top of it never happens. Hmm. And I think a lot of people might forget that, that the song is actually never played mm. until the credits. Because the melody is played. So they probably yeah, just the remember. Yeah, the is played. Yeah. And the last song I noted was Blue by I. <laughs> Eiffel 65. Yes. I never knew is... the name of the band. Eiffel really? 65. Oh, Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, I'm blue. And everyone yeah. was trying to figure out if it was dabba dee dabba die or if I was green, I would die. I know. And there were so many arguments over that. So oh. many. But it was like the perfect song from like early 2000s. Yes. These are all songs that I remember from elementary school and high school and they all suck. They were terrible. Hey. Okay, fine. With the exception <laughs> of Céline Dion's song. I was going to say Blue, but... <laughs> oh, God. But not only is Who Let the Dogs Out a super annoying song, it's also Ooh. about aggressive men hitting on women and not taking the hint. Right. That they don't want to be hit on. I so. wonder if Thong Song is on that list as it well. It is. Cisco's Thong yep, Song? Okay, it is. Perfect. Da, 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 da. Oh, God. It's terrible. Now you're just wondering what else is on the list. I know I am. Anyway, (laughs) I'll look that up. We'll look it up later. Yeah, you can look it up. We can put a link to it on Facebook or Twitter or all that other social media stuff. Yeah. We could put a playlist together. Oh, God. And share it. The Bad Place playlist? Yes. Oh, goodness. Okay. I wonder if there is one on Spotify. We can check it out. But this is a playlist that people just won't want to listen to. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Or listen to it ironically. Ooh. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does that send you to the bad place? Listening to it ironically, but actually kind of loving it. Yeah, that's probably on Michael's checklist or yeah. his litmus test. Yeah. Chidi says at this moment, I ish- Well, and then when we flash back to the dinner with the foursome, of course, Trevor has to ask, you know, if Chidi and Eleanor <laughs> ever slept together. Mm-hmm. And he says it in the Go most crude town. way. Yeah, yeah. And she's... Uh, what does he ever say? What does he say to her? Uh, something like, did you pork the, the nerd or pork the dork or something like that? Yeah. yeah. So he's just being completely crude about it. And then Chidi says to real Eleanor, I assure you our relationship, mine with fake Eleanor, was student teacher, nothing more. What do you make of Eleanor's reaction in that moment? Heartbreaking. Do you think that she's heartbroken because Honestly, she feels romantic feelings for him? No. Okay. Because honestly, I don't think Chidi realized what he was saying. Yeah. I think he was just trying to, he was being defensive. Like, I'm not, I didn't sleep with Eleanor. There was no sexual 
interactions whatsoever. I didn't sleep with that woman. I did not have sex. I did not have <laughs> sexual relations with that woman. Yeah. Don't that. they bring that up later? Like it's one of the karaoke things, the Monica Lewinsky speech. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Um, <laughs> but I don't think he realizes the effect of his words. Yeah. And if he, if Eleanor said, what, we're not friends or something like that, then he'd mm-hmm. be like, oh, no, no, I didn't mean that at all. Take it all back. Mm-hmm. But Eleanor is crushed because it made it sound like he was only her teacher. Right. And they weren't friends. Beyond that, it was strictly professional. Mm-hmm. They weren't buds. They weren't yeah. hanging out, have, enjoying each other's company. Yeah, which we know is not true. Right. Right. There is a relationship there. Mm-hmm. It may not be sexual at this point. <laughs> Jason gave me quite the look there. <laughs> but it's still a relationship. They're still friends. Yeah. It, yeah. I think it can be read either way. And I think it's mainly supposed to be that, hey, we're friends. Like, you don't have an emotional connection generally to people that you only have a professional relationship with. Right. So I think she's hurt in that moment, but I think there could be a little bit of something there. Like a little bit of, oh, I thought maybe something, maybe, with the two of us would happen. I don't think she thought that until... I think she might have thought that before real Eleanor showed up. Yeah, yeah, But as soon as she steps off the train, I think all that goes out the window. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. You don't hold... Like, you don't hold hands with somebody that you see as, like, your student, right? No, you don't. And he's going and he's holding hands with her. He's having these longing looks with her. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. There's something. Okay. I think. You can still hold hands with your friends. I guess so. I just don't. Personally. I don't personally. Yeah, no. Hand-holding is not inherently romantic or sexual. Sexual hand-holding. What would that even be like? It sounds like something that Bob would roll on the sexy dice. If anyone is watching American Gods in the episode with Salim and the Jinn, that is sexy handholding. He touches his hand, a little, little graze. It's very sensual. Hand stroking is very different than handholding. Fine. If we're gonna get into the nitty gritty, we of it. should be getting into the nitty gritty of it. <laughs> That's what this whole thing is about. Exactly. All right. Fine. Um, what do you think of this particular flashback? Eleanor is just being really stubborn. Mm. She's a very glass half empty perspective at this point. Like yeah. immediately assuming she's going to get screwed over of her money. Yeah. Or I'm not going to give you money and then you get the points and this is just bananas. I'm, I'm just going to do my own thing. Mm-hmm. And I kind of get it. I mean, she's making a huge deal about it. But yeah. I know some people who are big sticklers with their scene points. I don't know if you have scene points over there in the States, but... They're movie points, basically. Yeah. Some of my friends are very particular with their scene points. They will not let me buy their ticket. Okay. Unless they give me their scene points. Or if we're going to go see a movie and we buy our tickets online, they have to buy it because they have the scene card. Hmm. I kind of get where she's coming from. I don't think it's a huge deal. Hmm. But on the other side of it, I can see it being taken as kind of an insult. Like, I don't trust my friends to pay me back. Hmm. And I believe that my friends have ulterior motives. Yeah, I don't think it's a huge deal, but I think it's just another point showing us that Eleanor thinks that people's motivations are generally corrupt. Yeah. And that she pushes people away. Yep. All right, let's continue. The party... Oh, fuck. I say continue now. Okay. All right, let's move on. The party continues at Tahani's home, including hate speech karaoke and beer kegs. Fake Eleanor bemoans her unenviable situation while doing shots with Trevor. So the Bad Place crew say that they're snorting the concept of time. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that it would totally fork you up. (laughs) I think it would. Um, Would it give you like a blast from the past? No, just the, the idea of time, like when you start really thinking about it. I think gets really complicated and people tend to get pretty tangled up in it. Mm -hmm. So I think it almost seems like they're starting it and then it confuses the hell out of them, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Like it makes them really think about time. Yeah. Question everything. Question existence. It's not actual time manifested into a dusty substance. No, I think it's the concept of time, like the idea of time, because time is something that we've created right like language has created time 
has created words to describe the passage of time, right? Right. The past, the present, the future, that kind of thing. Uh, a little philosophy side note. I did a little bit of wiki-ing <laughs> because this is not my area of expertise as far as uh, philosophy goes. That's some thorough research. Yeah, totally. Eternalism is a philosophical approach to the ontological nature of time, which takes the view that points in time are equally real, as opposed to the presentist idea that only the present is real, and the growing block universe theory of time, which says that past and present are real while the future is not. So there's like different theories out there. So it's interesting that idea of past and present and future being real, I think it's a bit easier to understand if we say whether it exists or not. So mm -hmm. universe, the growing block universe theory says that basically reality is the present of reality and the future is an expanding block or brick. Okay. And that slivers of the future... Mm-hmm gets slowly brought into the present by this expanding block and only those slivers as they are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger based on the growing block mm -hmm. exist and the past is the past is there so the idea is, is that there does exist a past but it's lifeless and inactive consciousness as well as the flow of time is not active within the past and can only occur at the boundary of the block universe, which the present exists. So it's crazy. Oh, yeah. Like it's absolutely it bananas. Totally messes with their head because we, like, generally have a very fixed concept of time. Like, mm -hmm. what happened in the past was real. What's happening now is real. And the future is unknown, but is still a real thing. It still is going to exist. Probably. So... We assume that it will, anyway. We live like it will. Right. Most of us do. So if people believe in time travel, they have to be eternalists, which eternalism says that past and present and future all exist. Yes. Whereas, all points in time are equally real. Right. Yeah. So maybe accessible. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, going back to what I said earlier about um, the past existing, although it is lifeless and inactive, Reminded me a lot of a Stephen King short story called The Langoliers, where people get trapped in the past. Okay. And it's barren, it's lifeless, there's no smells, there's no sounds, and it's just, it just exists mm -hmm. as an empty shell yeah. that people have moved on from. Because does time really exist if no one is there to observe it? Sure. Because for someone who is not conscious, right, time doesn't really exist to them. But it does as soon as they awaken. As soon as they awaken. But if you're going into the past where no one is there, mm -hmm. like you're saying, that's yeah. barren. It's a wasteland. No one's there. Mm -hmm. um, then no one is observing it. And so it's kind of like it's not really alive. It's right. not existing. And in this short story, there are creatures that follow time and eat up the past. Oh. And get rid of it. Okay. They devour it into nothingness. Oh, that's so weird. It's kind of a throwaway line, like, oh, okay, it's not cocaine, it's just the concept of time, but it's a smart joke, I mm -hmm. think, because the concept of time is actually really confusing when you think too much about it. And all the different theories that are out there, like, there's so many different views that I think it really will fork you up. But it seems like mm -hmm. something that smart people would love to talk about. Yes. So Michael creates karaoke. He does. He just conjures it out of nowhere. Yeah, because I don't. He doesn't ask for Janet to do that. No. Mm -mm. And did we not have this discussion last week about yeah. whether Michael was able to do this? Yeah, I think that he is. It's, it certainly seems that he is able to. Yep. But didn't we say last week that he can't? Well, I think we were saying that maybe there are certain things he can't conjure. Like, Eleanor's file might be inaccessible to him because he's currently in The Good Place. And maybe that's just out of reach. Okay. But he's able to manifest things like a karaoke machine and that kind of stuff. A coffin. Yeah. Yeah. And a banner. I think that's where I land on at this point. Okay. I think that he can do, like, basic retrieval of things. 
maybe not stuff like files. Like that Eleanor's in files. The bad yeah, place. yeah. Okay. He doesn't have access to the bad places filing system, which is probably really bad. Oh god. It's probably maybe a that's room. why Janet couldn't find anything. Well, yeah. Well, part of it. Part of why she couldn't. Yeah. yeah. I can just picture a room like the Which treasure- crumpled up balls of paper. Well, like the vault in Indiana Jones at the very end when they're putting the Ark of the Covenant in there. And it's just an endless Costco size warehouse full of paper that's just stacks of paper that are fallen over and oh my God. half buried. And it sounds like a nightmare. There's an old lady in there that's like sweeping. There's and someone, she constantly yeah. is moving files around because she's sweeping them in other piles. Uh, and ugh. There's someone in the bad place who's being tortured by t- trying to file all that stuff and never being able to. Oh, That's terrible. Absolutely or correct. every time they kind of get it right, they get a paper cut. Ooh. In like the finger crotch. Or there's somebody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the place where your fingers meet. That's your finger crotch. Yeah. Worst place to get a paper cut. I think there's two people filing and one person is told to do it alphabetically and the other person told to do it like numerically or something. And they oh both God. are don't aren't aware of the other person. So the files keep getting moved around and someone keeps taking the files from somebody else. And oh, it's just a nightmare. I think we're giving somebody out there who has an office job who does filing a nightmare right now. Yeah. Like... We're going to fuel their nightmares. I apologize. <laughs> I don't. Right now. <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> so when Eleanor's having shots with Trevor, Trevor's assessment of Eleanor doesn't account for her time in the good place at all. Like, he's just thinking of her as the person that she was on Earth. Right. Which is fair, because that's what... That's what she's being judged on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, His behavior in this entire episode is, like, really insidious. He repeatedly calls her names. Not only does he coin the name fake Eleanor, mm-hmm. but he calls her a trash bag. Um, <laughs> he calls her a like a human made out of mulch and dead leaves yep. and dead slugs. Um, he's also calling her like really infantilizing and frustrating like little pet names like sweetheart and babe. Um, and then... He's forcing her to spend time with the real Eleanor because he invites the two of them to go for dinner with them, forces her to see Chidi with his true soulmate, and he really succeeds in making her feel worthless. He's doing his job in the bad place. He's doing it up into the good place. Yeah. And he's not really violating any rules. Like, he's not torturing her physically. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, he is, though. So we see that there's a loophole. There's a way to get around this system. Like you don't actually have to be kind and yeah. good here. You can make people feel like crap in the good place. Just using your words. Yeah. Yeah. And the people that are surrounding you. Mm-hmm. And in this moment, she gives up the fight. She does. And it's really sad to see. Yeah, it really She's is. She's defeated. Yeah. She feels like not only does she belong in the bad place, but she deserves to be there. And that I think is the heartbreaking part for me is because... We've seen her improve, right? And for her to still think that that's what she deserves as an afterlife is really sad. I think she felt like she could start to belong here until Trevor arrived and started cutting her down. Cutting her down slowly and slowly. Like a kind of a death by a thousand cuts type of situation. Yep. Yeah, that's hard. Tahani is upset that Michael let the Bad Place crew mistreat him. The next morning, everyone gathers at Tahani's for negotiation session. Eleanor and Michael fe- Eleanor and Michael fight to keep her in the good place, and Trevor threatens to call Sean, the wise eternal judge. In the final flashback, Eleanor rejects an offer to work full-time at a community-oriented company and rejoices in the solitary work environment of the fake drug company. The episode ends with Tahani confronting her soulmate. Tahani gives Michael some really solid advice in this episode, actually. And what does she say to Michael? Well, she tells him to stand up for himself. Mm -hmm. Michael in this episode is a parent of a teenager and doesn't know how to handle him. That's what it it really felt like. He was saying, these are the type of people that scare me. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like an old person saying, (laughs) teenagers scare me. Oh, goodness. Because they're so loud and obnoxious. 
And that so, music they listen to isn't really music. Exactly. Yeah. So I, it really felt like Michael was the parent of an unruly teen who doesn't know how to handle them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're acting out and they end up on Maury or something. Yeah. Oh, God. You're not doing a great job if your kid's up, kid ends up on Maury. Or Dr. Phil. Catch me outside. How about that? <laughs> um, and going back to Eleanor and Chidi, when Chidi wakes Eleanor up in the bathtub, um, she tries to give him an out. She's like, no, 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 no. You d- you can just stay with the real Eleanor and do whatever it is the nerds do. Like, I'm going to be fine. Don't worry about me. She's put she's, up her wall. She's already starting to distance herself before she can be rejected. Like, yeah. it's easier to just reject someone else than to wait for them to reject you. And I think that's what she's assuming Chidi's going to do. Even knowing him, she's like, no, everybody abandons me. Yeah. Everybody eventually leaves because I'm awful. Right? She's so hard on herself. Like, her distancing behavior, all the put-downs, all the rejections of group of groups are just a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, she distanced herself, then other people think of her as a bad person, then she ends up believing the same thing about herself, and the whole cycle just continues. And I think that this is the first person. Like, Chidi is the first person to work hard enough to break through those walls. I'd like to say it's not all cheaty. Eleanor's contributing a lot to it. She's mm-hmm. helping Cheaty help her. Yes, she's that's letting, true. She's being open. Yes, she's she's a, a little bit more accepting in this situation. And I think that's because she doesn't... Originally, deep down, when she started to do this, is because she didn't want to go to hell. Mm-hmm. She did not want to go to the bad place. So it all stems from the first day here. Yeah. Opening up. To let Chidi in to help her. Yeah. And then once she opened up a little bit, it was easier and easier for her to open up more and more and start to feel again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's been nice because it's a it's a great reciprocal relationship. They're both putting a lot into it. Mm-hmm. It's but it's so hard for her. Yeah. And it's really nice that Chidi just, just refuses to believe that moment. Like, he sees right through that bull shirt and he says <laughs> to her... Just because we have a new guest in the house, which is interesting. He says but he guest. says guest. Yeah. He doesn't say just because I have a soulmate now. He that just That would be guest. harsh. Yeah. Just because we have a new guest in the house doesn't mean I'm not still going to be there for you. I'm in this. We're a team. Mm-hmm. Which is a little heavy handed. Like, you know, we're dealing a lot with like being part of the team and that kind of stuff. But I like it coming from Chidi. Like the two of them especially have really been a team. So this you didn't find time. it too on the nose with the flashbacks? I felt like it was fine coming from Chidi. I didn't particularly care for it in the flashbacks. I felt like it was a little too heavy handed in the flashbacks. Okay. Yeah. And then later when Michael says it, it was, or earlier when Michael says it, it was a little bit on the nose. Mm-hmm. But from Chidi, I don't know. It just feels like it works for me. So calling back to the episode title, which was... Someone like me as a member. Someone like me as a member. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't want to be a part of which group? I think that she has been... I think that she, this self-fulfilling prophecy of hers has made her think that she is this awful person. Mm-hmm. So any team that will have her has to be terrible, right? Like she, And that she can't possibly fit in with good people. Right. Right? Which is why she immediately knows she doesn't belong in the good place. Like, mm-hmm. she knows this isn't real. Yeah, everybody's Um, too goody-goody. Yeah, and why she never felt like, or she never really feels like she can belong. And she still says at the end of the episode, like, no, I I know I'm not supposed to be here, but I want to be here. Like, that's what matters. Yeah. Is I'm finally deciding that maybe I deserve better. I deserve to be part of a good team. Mm -hmm. I would love to get emails from people um, letting us know, like, do you think... The same as I do? Do you see it how I see it? Or do you think that Eleanor is just a jerk, you know, who pushes people away because she doesn't like people? Because she's been damaged as a child. We didn't really talk about that excuse at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. How she said, you know, I was... My my parents were divorced when I was eight. Yeah. And that really does a lot of damage to somebody. 
And she she really says it in like the this is an excuse kind yeah, of tone. Yeah, absolutely. But there's something real there. She says, my parents are both crummy people, Mm -hmm. and then they got divorced when I was eight. And we will see a little bit more about her parents later on. But at this moment, we're just hearing the same thing we heard in the pilot episode. My parents were both bad people. Now, she says, my parents are both bad people, and they're divorced. So that's why I am the way I am. Yeah. And then real Eleanor... Of course, says, oh, you know, that's that must have been really hard. Mm-hmm. I don't and know. She's what actually that's... sympathetic. She yeah. is. I don't. She doesn't know what that's like because she was an orphan. Yada yada yada. <laughs> and it didn't feel like she was shutting down our Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Like I'm better than you because you went through crap, but I went through even more crap. Yeah. And it does affect people. Parents getting divorced can have different effect on all sorts of different kids yeah it can be depending on the divorce depending on the parents depending on their social situation everything can have an impact you can become a horrible person because of this situation or you can become a better person yeah it's unfair for eleanor to blame everything on her parents yeah i agree but it's unfair for us to say that she shouldn't be she affected shouldn't at be all. She shouldn't be affected at all, yeah. exactly, okay. because, yeah. you know, 50% of people go through divorce. It's no big deal. Yeah. That, it's a normal and, thing. And that's just like what, what Trevor, Trevor is said. saying. Yeah, exactly. like, oh, the only, the thing that happened to you is what happens to 50% of all kids in America. Yeah, get like, over it. For some reason, that makes it not... Yeah, that doesn't make it okay. ...upsetting or traumatic or yeah. however it was. Like, and then she doesn't just say, my parents got divorced. She says, my parents were crummy people. Mm-hmm. She doesn't go into detail about it. The fact that she doesn't go into detail, to me, makes me believe that there's a lot more to it. Like, it's worse than she says. Oh, okay. Because I think she would, she might be the type of person to go into detail Mm -hmm. if she wasn't so affected by it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. She hasn't really shared anything about Maybe brag about how crappy they were. Like, my dad lost all her money at the tracks and my mom smoked away our rent smoked away our rent i don't know drugs <laughs> yeah, are whatever. bad whatever and <laughs> drugs are bad dare. i don't know <laughs> but yeah um, all this to say that even though eleanor was using that as an excuse she's not doing that in the good place anymore so she's changed her mind she's decided yeah whatever happened to me happened and i'm gonna make the best of my situation and try to be better which in all honesty she should have done like 20 years ago yeah but but she's doing she's it now. She's doing it. She's making the steps. Yeah. And it's important. Mm-hmm. Which is all part of Chidi's argument against the good place being so black and white and not taking into account people's growth after their death. Most improved player. Yeah, exactly. And another little point I wanted to bring up is that the negotiations in this episode brought up the notion of justice for me. Yeah. Because the afterlife... like a democracy. Yeah, in a way. And then, like, they're they're negotiating, right? And it's just to get the people from the back place to go. Mm-hmm. And for them to still be able to keep both Eleanors. But then I started thinking, okay, well, the afterlife is... A, lo- a lot of it is about justice, right? Especially the bad place, right? The bad place is all about punishment. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to hear your thoughts. Do you think justice is about equality? Or about fairness? Do you think it's about getting what we deserve or getting what we need? Getting what you deserve is completely based on like a judicial court. So that to me is justice. Okay. Right now, they don't have anybody governing the situation. It's two lawyers fighting head to head. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what Trevor thinks is just. Mm Mm-hmm. Or what Michael thinks is just. Because there's no mediator. So they need a mediator. They need Sean. They need Sean. Yep. So, personally, justice can't be reached until somebody higher up brings the ruling. Okay. And what do you think, just from watching this episode, what do you think Sean's view on justice is going to be? I think his view is going to be Trevor's view. Okay. Because 
in the good place or the bad place, people are judged pre-death. So in that situation, Eleanor would go to the bad place. But that's, I believe that's only because that's how it's been done. And that's how it's always been done. Mm -hmm. And maybe it shouldn't be. So what do you think? Do you think in this situation, what is your idea of justice? I think that Eleanor should be given the chance to improve because she's already shown improvements. So do you think everybody should be given a chance to improve? I think that the system as it is, is broken. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, there should be. I'm not sure how I would go about constructing that or anything like that. Yeah. I, I don't have any concrete <laughs> You're not plans the architect. Here. But yeah, I think that people, especially like Eleanor, who weren't going around killing people. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying try and rehabilitate like Charles Manson, but Eleanor, someone who is crappy and also probably crappy because of crappy things that happened to her too. Like sure. part of that is because she grew up in a bad environment. And trying to show them love and friendship and make them a better person through education and kindness. And Mm -hmm. I think that there's a way to do that. Do you think that Sean would agree with you? Or do you think he sides? Do you think he sides with Michael or do you think he would side with Trevor? I think he would side with Trevor. I agree with you there because Trevor's the one who mentions him in the first place. Michael doesn't seem ecstatic about the idea of him joining. And he probably is archaic. This is how the afterlife has been run for forever. So it's doubtful that he is a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Do you think Sean is God or the good places idea of God? Maybe not the Godhead himself, but like right underneath, like almost his assistant. Right. That's my, that's what I would think as well. Like God would send down his judge. So if we're saying possibly that, Sean would be second in command or the next person in the hierarchy of the good place, whether it's more like a business or whether it's more like a religious thing. But I don't think he's the second in command of the good place because he's Michael says that he judges over like he has the final say in all activity between the two realms. Yeah, no, I didn't say. So he's like, it's almost like he's the neutral. Yeah, you did. Oh, that's not what I meant. Oh, okay, well, that's sorry, that's what you said. Huh. Um, so he's kind of like a neutral party. Right, so okay. it would be like somebody owning a bunch of houses and looking over them. Like a landlord of like two different houses. One's in a crappy neighborhood, one's in a good one. Yeah, I guess so. It's fairly <laughs> accurate. And dealing with tenant disputes. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> sure. So do you think that Sean directly reports back to the head? Maybe. But it's probably a case of, you know, you do your work quietly and I don't need to hear about it because you're doing it. Hmm. See, I think that in this story, the realms are looked over by not one god, but a group. Okay. Like... So there's no head? Right. Okay. It's like a majority... They're all majority shareholders in a company. They all own a percentage. They sit at the their board of directors, basically. Okay. And the CEO maybe is, quote unquote, the head, but he still doesn't hold any power. I don't know how I feel yet, so I won't say anything just now. With the introduction of Sean, this episode really opens up a bit more of the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Showing that there's more parties involved, especially yes. with the introduction of Trevor. And his lackeys were seeing more and more of what's outside of the good place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. It opens things up a little bit more, like you said. And it makes me excited to discover more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in our last little part of our episode, we get Tahani confronting Jason. Or Jianyu in her mind. I think that that subplot was really subtly laid out in the episode. I liked that. That was fun. Because we don't really get the hint that Tahani's suspicious of Jason throughout the episode. But then right at the end, it's sort of a nice surprise. Yeah, you didn't expect it at all. Yeah, you know. And I think part of him is not trying that hard anymore. Especially now that Eleanor has been discovered. Yeah, I really liked that as well because you didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. You didn't see it coming at all. Yeah. All right. I think 
I'm pretty much done for my commentary on this episode. The non-spoilery part of this episode, right. anyway. We do have a spoiler zone we after do. the music. We do. So if you haven't watched the episode, then don't listen any further. Because we are about to enter the spoiler zone. Exactly. So that brings us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and a review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, if you think that maybe Eleanor's just a jerk and that's all there is to it, you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and use the hashtag FBullshirt, or you can find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can also visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. Yes, C-A, because we're Canadian. Woohoo. <laughs> Cheers, mm. eh? Yeah. We <laughs> <laughs> sounded like a goat. <laughs> Whoops. Um, we will see you next week for our review of episode 10, Chidi's Choice. Mm. Which is a fun shipper episode, if I do say so myself. Spoiler. Spoilers. Not really. Not really, though. <laughs> All, right. All right, see you guys next week. See you then. Jason, you're not singing with me. I don't like you anymore. Okay. Solo song. I'm going solo. You're like, taking this on the road? Yeah, like Justin style. Timberlake. Spoiler, spoiler zone. Spoiler, spoiler zone. Spoiling spoiler everything. Spoiling, spoiling movies. Spoiling food. <laughs> it's not Penny's boat. <laughs> <laughs> you bailed on that I last totally one. I totally bailed. I'm sorry. Uh, I just... You kind of messed up on f- movies. You were like, for movies. <laughs> it's okay. I spoiled it. <laughs> this whole song is a bit of a spoil. Oh, good point. Okay. So, in the first flashback, when we see Eleanor in high school, now we know that Eleanor is already living on her own. She has emancipated herself from her parents. Really? Yep. How did we know this? Because we see in a flashback, I can't remember if it's in the finale. I, think I don't think it's, it's in the, the finale, when she but I think leaves. it might be episode 12 um, where she leaves. And she's clearly younger at that point when she gets her parents to sign the emancipation yeah, isn't papers. Yeah, she like 14 or something or like 12? Yeah, she's like 13 or 14, yeah. I think. And in this high school, she's saying, I'm here for like six months. And we get the impression that she's probably senior year. That's what I thought anyway. So she must have paid for those braces by herself. Good for her. And she made it to college and, well, she made it to high school and to college all on her own. And she was probably working while going to school too. So when Eleanor, the real Eleanor, who's not actually Eleanor at all, but this actress saying, you know, I put myself through law school and I did all these other things. Like, yeah, those are all admirable things, but... Our Eleanor, Eleanor did, it. did a pretty great job of taking care of herself. Like, Going at solo. least, you know, in a basic needs kind of way. Like, keeping herself fed, getting her education, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She stayed off the streets, didn't do drugs. She was on her own. She had nobody to care for and care about but herself. Yeah, exactly. And I think that really made her very self-reliant mm-hmm. to a fault, though, yep. and ended up backfiring. Um, as far as her personal life goes. So we do see some other people messing around with Eleanor and Chidi. Oh, yeah? We've only seen, in the past, we've only really seen Bart and... Nina. Nina. But now we see fake Eleanor. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we ever got a solid answer on whether Trevor is an actor or actually pulled up from a bad place. There is no Yeah, we don't. we don't yet. know yet. But it's still nice to see other parties taking jabs because mm-hmm. we've we've had Michael for the past eight episodes. Yeah. So it's nice to see someone new and do it so smooth like butter the way fake Eleanor just keeps on saying all these great things. And mm-hmm. oh, she's well informed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She knows what Chidi will respond to because she's supposed to be his real soulmate. Mm-hmm. Right. So she's playing him like a fiddle. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, so sad, though. Poor Chidi. 
So Chidi in this episode is getting no torture except for seeing Eleanor being hurt. Yeah. Then when he sees Michael stand up for her, then he feels better. Like you can see the relief on his face Mm -hmm. and he shares a nice little moment with Eleanor that I actually forgot to bring up there. He's staring at her like he, he looks over at her and he's got this look on his face like, we got you. We got you. Like you are part of our team. Yo. We got you, fam. <laughs> yeah, to- totally. Um, I said totes. <laughs> and Eleanor just kind of slowly looks over at him and sees that he's looking at her and they share a nice little look there. But yeah, I guess you could argue that Jason is being tortured because he can't participate in all the bad plays. He's continuously being tortured because he's excluded because he can't be himself. Right. So last couple things I want to say before we wrap up our very long episode at this point. <laughs> In the finale, Eleanor says that the four of them became a team. And I thought that was really sweet. It's a callback to this episode for sure. And the last thing I want to say is that some fans had a theory that Michael's co-workers slipped in Eleanor and Jason to mess with him because it was his first project and he had decided to stay in the good place. I think that's an interesting theory. Like, Like... Obviously, we know that's not true at this point, but I think if I had been looking through, like, message boards while I was watching the show, I think I probably would have uh, thought maybe that's that's how it happened. Like, or at least for Jason, anyway, because we know that Eleanor, like, the two Eleanors. In this episode, we're given the information that they both died in the same parking lot in the same 100th of a second or which whatever. Which we know is completely bogus. Yeah. But, so the idea would be that Michael's good place, his coworkers want him to kind of give them a hard time so they just slip in some people who don't belong yeah interesting it's interesting but then that's, it that's messes, fun to think about but it since messes we know with, how it ends yeah and it messes with your idea of what the architects are about right like if they're if they're the trying architect? to do something like this that's messing with people's afterlife mm-hmm. and their emotions and stuff then that's not do you think there nice. are good architects and bad architects I think that there are good place architects and bad place architects. And I think, so do you think Trevor... the good place architects are good people. And I think the bad place architects are bad people. Do you think Trevor is <gasps> maybe the bad place architect? What if like those people are evolved from the people who got to the bad place? Like what, you like go Trevor? to the bad. No, you. Okay. So imagine Eleanor had gone to the bad place. She goes there and then like. During her eternity, she slowly moves up the ladder and becomes an architect. Do you think that could ever happen? That'd be interesting. Anyway, Hmm. that's just a thought. Very random. Probably never going to go anywhere. (laughs) But think about it, guys. Think about it. So does this mean that Trevor is the bad place architect? I don't know if he's the bad place architect because I don't know if the architects ever go and stay in their neighborhoods because when Michael proposes staying there... Everyone's like, what? We don't do that. Right. So so I think he's just kind of the manager. I think, okay, it makes sense for me because the architect, if the architect was living in Trevor's bad place, mm-hmm. if the, that bad place architect was living there, then Trevor would not be there. Yeah. Because the architect would be there. Yeah. So if this were the good place, mm-hmm. then, and Michael was not living there, then there would be another manager like Trevor, but good place version. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. It's it could be a little bit different because the good place is just people living out their afterlife. You know, day to day life kind of stuff, right? Trying out new but hobbies. In the bad place it's being tortured. So yeah. somebody has to oversee the torture. Exactly. And in the good place you can just have Janet. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And if a problem arises then somebody can come Janet in. Janet can but... go get head security or something yeah okay well so we leave you with some thoughts listeners Mm -hmm. what do you think email us your opinion all right thank you so much if you've stuck with us through the spoiler zone then you are quite the dedicated fan and we appreciate it yeah if you're listening to us right now that means you stuck with us yeah exactly yeah good for you yourself on the back high fives all around Self five. Um, all around, Jason, there should be way more high fives. That's not gonna get annoying. It's all around the mic. Oh right, okay, cute. 
<laughs> someone listening is going to be like, oh, surround sound. Surround sound slaps. <laughs> Someone's slapping my head all around it. High-fiving your head. Think on the bright side, guys. Okay. And that will do it for us this week. Bye. Bye.